seated. Hey, welcome to Redeemer. I'm one of the pastors here. My name is Matt Odom, and we are uh, continuing on in our series through the book of Esther. And one of the things that Esther teaches us, uh, among among many things, is that no one, uh, we've said this before, but no one is going to get away with anything, ever. And God's justice uh, weaves together in the plan of God and in the works and history of man and brings together a perfect, complete, full justice. Now, part of uh, how he does that is that he gives human beings that don't want his love, which we just sing about, he gives human beings over to what they naturally want without him. And that's what our psalm is about that we're going to be called into worship with, that when we seek to live outside of a relationship with God, God's not cruel in, in how he punishes us. He just says, okay, you can have life the way that you want it. And what, what happens is that what's born in, inside of us gives birth to death. And part of the hope of the gospel is that Jesus Christ comes into the world, and he was the only person who didn't seek to live apart from God. And that's why it says things like, abide in me, and you'll find life. 
And so this psalm is talking about the reality of sin, but it's also talking about the reality of justice. And when you turn to God, when you say to God, Lord, take everything inside of me out that is against you. That's when the gospel of God's justice is great news. It's good news. And so um, we're going to call ourselves into that reality from Psalm uh, 7, verses 14 through 17. The way that we do that here at Redeemer is that we all stand and we look at the, the text here and we read it together. So let's stand and call each other into worship. So read this with me. Behold, the wicked man conceives evil and is pregnant with mischief and gives birth to lies. He makes a pit, digging it out, and falls into the hole that he has made. His mischief returns upon his own head, and on his own skull his violence descends. I will give to the Lord the thanks due to his righteousness, and I will sing praise to the name of the Lord, the Most High. Let's continue in worship.
God of our salvation, revive us again in your unfailing love. salvation. God, we ask that you would restore us. God, teach us what it means to see you as our good shepherd, to see you when we walk through valleys, that we would look and see your grandeur and your glory, and to behold you and to be transformed in that beholding. So, God, we give you all the praise and honor and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. So our practice to your Redeemer, to say hello to someone, to greet the people around you, to welcome them, to say, catch up on the week. So, say hello to someone, be called back for the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Children, preschool through third grade are dismissed at this time. And uh, as a reminder, just pick your kids up. Adults, pick your kids up after church. And everything is now in the portable back here. Thank you, Don Marie. Um, sweet, short and sweet today for announcements. Camp Redeemer is today. 
and we're going to meet at Camp Sunshine this year from 1 to 7. So no lunch, but we will be gathering for dinner this evening. And please enter the camp from the south side, that direction. Um, we'll have a bounce house, we'll have games, we'll have a campfire, snacks and s'mores, and then that potluck dinner. So please bring bug spray, camp chairs, a snack, or a dinner item uh, to share tonight. And then um, if you want to play any particular games like frisbee or football, feel free to bring those as well. We're going to have offering next, so let's pray. Father God, we just come before you. Um, offering our hearts, offering our minds, our bodies, and and also the things that you have given to us. We um, just take a moment to give thanks for and offer back to you for the work of your church. In your name we pray. Amen. <laughs> Thank you, Brian. I like when you play, man. Sounds good. Um, a re-announcement. Uh, if you're coming to Camp Redeemer, Trish from Camp Redeemer said, make sure all your people enter from the south side. So just remember, south side, the, uh, the announcements has kind of the directions of how you get there. So enter Camp Sunshine from the south. Enter Camp Sunshine from the south. Okay. All right. Um, there is a, a lot of text today, and there's, it's important to, when you hear, when you hear Scripture read, oftentimes it's, it's very easy to disengage. One of the things that we try to do a lot here at Redeemer is that we try to make sure that we remember that God's present in the midst of us when we pray and when we read Scripture. And so I don't, I don't want you to cash out as I'm reading two chapters of the book of Esther. And you may be like, why did I come here to listen to somebody read two chapters that I could go home and read myself? And the reason why we do that together is because this is what Christians have done for centuries. Uh, they gather together around the word, and we believe that actually this is far more important than whatever I say about it. And so uh, when we say give, atten give your attention to God's word, I really do want us to pay attention to, um, to these two chapters. This is the turning point in the story of Esther. And so uh, I'm going to read these two chapters. We'll spend some moments in silence before we pray, and then uh, we'll talk about it for a little bit. So this is Esther chapter 6, and we'll read all the way through chapter 6 and 7. So this is where the story turns. On that night, the king could not sleep. That's King Xerxes. And he gave orders to bring the book of memorable deeds, the Chronicles, and they were read before the king, found written how Mordecai had told about Bigthana and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs who guarded the threshold and who had sought to lay hands on King Xerxes. And the king said, what honor or distinction has been bestowed on Mordecai for this? The king's young men who attended him said, nothing has been done for him. And the king said, well, who's in the court? Now Haman had just entered the outer court of the king's palace to speak to the king about having Mordecai hanged on the gallows that he had prepared for him. So just at that moment, the king's young men told him, Haman's out there standing in the court. And the king said, let him come in. So Haman came in and the king said to him, Haman, what should be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. 
And Haman said to himself, Well, who would the king delight to honor more than me? And Haman said to the king, For the man whom the king delights to honor, let royal roads be brought, which the king has worn, and let the horse that the king has ridden on his horse head, a royal crown is set, and let the robes and the horse be handed over to him, to one of the king's most noble officials, and let them dress the man whom the king delights to honor, and let them lead him on a horse through the square of the city, proclaiming before him, Thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. And then the king said to Haman, Hurry, take the robes and the horse, as you have said, and do so to Mordecai the Jew, who sits at the king's gate, and leave out nothing that you have mentioned. And so Haman took the robes and the horse, and he dressed Mordecai, and led him through the square of the city, proclaiming before him, Thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. And then Mordecai returned to the king's gate, but Haman hurried to his house, mourning, with his head covered, and Haman told his wife Zeresh and all his friends everything that had happened to him. And then his wise men and his wife Zeresh said to him, If Mordecai, before whom you begin to fall, is of the Jewish people, you will not overcome him, but will surely fall before him. And while they were yet talking with him, the king's eunuchs arrived and hurried to Haman to the feast that Esther had prepared. So the king and Haman went to the feast with Queen Esther. And on the second day, as they were drinking wine after the feast, the king again said to Esther, What is your wish, Queen Esther? It shall be granted to you. And what is your request? Even to the half of my kingdom it shall be fulfilled. And then Queen Esther answered, If I have found favor in your sight, O king, and if it please the king, let my life be granted me for my wish and for my people and for my request. For we have been sold, I and my people, to be destroyed and to be killed and to be annihilated. If we had been sold merely as slaves, men and women, I would have been silent, for our affliction is not to be compared with the loss of the king. But then King Xerxes said to Queen Esther, Who is he, and where is he, and who has dared to do this? And Esther said, A foe, an enemy, the wicked Haman. And then Haman was terrified before the king and the queen. And the king arose in his wrath from the wine drinking and went out into the palace of the garden, but Haman stayed to beg for his life from Queen Esther, for he saw the harm that was determined against him by the king. And the king returned from the palace garden to the place where they were drinking wine. And as Haman was falling on the couch where Esther was, and the king said, Will he even assault the queen in my presence in my own house? As the word left his mouth, left the mouth of the king, they covered Haman's face. Then Harbona, one of the eunuchs in attendance on the king, said, Moreover, the gallows that Haman has prepared for Mordecai, whose word saved the king, is standing at Haman's house, fifty cubits high. And the king said, Hang him on that. So they hung, they hanged Haman, Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai, and then the wrath of the king was abated. It's our practice here to spend some moments in silence, and the reason why we do that is because we're again remembering that God is present with us, but also just in the chaos of our lives, in the chaos of what goes on in our minds, we need, we need just a moment to remember um, that God is more present to you than you are to yourself right now, and so we're asking that he would illumine his word to us and that he would speak tenderly to us. And so let's spend some moments in silence and ask that God would uh, reveal himself to us together. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for another day and all that goes on in these chapters is a, a picture of Jesus and it's also a picture of your perfect and complete justice and a picture of all human beings who do not seek refuge in you, who seek to find a light elsewhere 
and seek to cling to things as if the world and the things of the world belong to us. And so, Lord, as we ungrip the things that have intoxicated us in this world, that we would turn to you. This is, this is the call to those who believe in you and those who may believe in you for the first time today. Our call is to turn to you and to release control, to release our own concept of what we think our life should be and how we should rule it, but that you would rule us, Lord, as the king that's perfect and wise. So would you do that now? In Christ's name, amen. Um, so in the first three verses of our passage, everything in the entire story uh, flips while the king was sleeping. Eugene Peterson, pastor, uh, is fond of saying God does his best work in and through us when we are asleep. And that's what the king was doing. He was sleeping, but his sleep was disturbed. And it seems kind of random because he woke up and he was thinking about history books. And so he's like, I wonder, did anyone honor this guy named Mordecai and no one did. And what's that, what that's to show is what the whole book of Esther has been showing us all along, which is that God is present all the time, especially when he seems like he's hidden, especially when his name isn't even mentioned, which his name is not mentioned in the entire book. And God's plan has always been to mend the world from the inside out, to renovate the world. Not to annihilate it, not to destroy it, but to go deep in the heart of the world and begin the process of restoring everything so that earth begins to look like heaven. This is what he taught his disciples to pray. Your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. And what we see in these two chapters is how God plans to do that in Persia. Um... So that's what we're going to look at, uh, specifically how God's plans and man's plans weave together to form justice, putting things back to the way that they're supposed to be. And it's ironic, the irony of justice in the kingdom of man and the kingdom of God. So this whole story has been set in the Persian kingdom, and in Persia there was a lot of drinking, there was a lot of parties. There's a lot of war, and there's a lot of sexual misconduct, a lot of people's bodies being used for the sexual pleasure of those in power. So you had eunuchs, bodies are altered for the king's pleasure, had a lot of concubines in his harem. And what's that, what, what that's to show is that the, the Persian kingdom was the kingdom of man on display. And what God does is that he sets his people in the midst of the kingdom of man, And this kingdom does not honor the Jewish people. This kingdom doesn't care about their culture. And this kingdom may even annihilate them. And what God wants his image bearers to do is to reflect him deep in the midst of the kingdom of man. Now, what we've been seeing over the last several weeks is that this character, Haman, is the embodiment of the self, pride, what human beings do when they go away from God, and it, he embodies the individualistic spirit of the Persian kingdom, but also our own culture today. When you idolize the self, what begins to happen when you set yourself above the community in which you're in, it ruins community, but it also ruins yourself. And this is what happens when we seek to rule our own lives, when we try to be little kings and queens of our own life. Um, When I was in uh, Turkey, I know I've been talking about Turkey and Greece a lot because it was very life-changing, but weirdly, tons and tons of Burger Kings in Turkey. Who would have thought? I thought it would be more of a a McDonald's place. But, um, you know, I was was reminded by a pastor friend of mine, you guys know the, the Burger King jingle, right? Have it your way, have it your way, have it your way. You rule, yeah, there you go, yeah. 
Um, that's the mantra of the kingdom of man. Have it your way. Have it your way. You rule. Now what happens when we live our life like that is that we become intoxicated with honor, with the attention of other people, with the admiration of other people. And you see that in chapter 6, verses 6 through 11. And on top of that, when you seek to rule your own life, the other people around you become inconsequential. They're not important to you unless they prop up the self. And in contrast, what you do with honor in God's kingdom is that you're sober about it. And you can share it. You can share your honor with others. And the most important thing in God's kingdom are other people. And so, we're going to look at that. The intoxication of honor in the kingdom of man. This is found in chapter 6, verses 6 through 11. Now, I want you to imagine, I want you to imagine the dopamine release in Haman's brain when he hears the king's question in verse 6. Remember the question. He says, Haman, what should I do for the man whom I really, really delight in? Remember, he was coming into the king's palace because he wanted Mordecai's head. He was so angry and trying to get revenge. And this, this question throws him off the scent of his own anger, of, his, of the thing that was on his brain so much. And we are given a super keen insight by the author with what is actually going on in, in Haman's mind. Because he says, who could the king possibly want to honor more than me. Now, we look at him sort of as like a ridiculous character, but I do want, I all, all want us to be careful that we don't judge Haman too quickly right now, because I want you to imagine, you know, if you post something online and it's, it's gaining some traction, you know, you get like 10, 10 or 20 likes. Um, what, if you, what if you got like 10 billion within the first hour? And what happens to the brain and the heart in the kingdom of self, when it gets that kind of attention, is that we become drunk. We become in intoxicated by the honor and the admiration of other people. We don't, we don't even know how to properly respond because it's so intoxicating. That's what's happening with Haman. And you can see his response when he's like, oh, I know what you should do for the person that you want to delight in, king. I want you to basically treat him like you treat yourself. Give him your... Give him your signet, give him your horse, give him your robes, and I want you to parade him around the empire and say, behold, this, this is the person that's like the greatest in the kingdom. And this is what Haman says is what you should do for the man in whom you delight. Now, the contrast in God's kingdom, people have honor, but, but they are sober about it, and therefore they can share it. For instance, Esther had the attention of the king, but she wasn't intoxicated by her appearance, and so it didn't control her. And that's why, that's what any honor uh, that you possess is ultimately meant for. It, it's meant for the benefit of others and for the glory of God. This is why even when we're young, you know, you play, with, you play with your toys and your siblings come and they snatch it away and they're like, this is mine. You know, this is, this is my toy. Um, all things in this life are meant to be given away. And we learn from a very, very early age that we belong to ourselves and that other things belong to us. And the moment we start to live life like that, we're being ruled by Burger King. We're ruling our own little kingdom. And one of, the, one of the most fascinating things about, I, I say heaven, but what I mean in Scripture is the kingdom of God, or, or the new creation that's coming into this world that has already begun in Jesus. One of the most bizarre things is that the honor that we see in other people, it will be as if it is ours, and what's ours is theirs, reflecting back the glory of God. When we come into God's presence giving our honor away, we reflect what God is like in the community of the Trinity. 
so that what you have highlights me and vice versa. So some of you maybe have um, saw the Kansas City Chiefs game this past Sunday. You know who's at the Chiefs game this past Sunday? Come on, you know. Taylor Swift, right? Taylor was there. Um, they say that Kelsey, Travis Kelsey's jerseys went up 400% this week. Why? It's because Taylor bestowed her honor on Travis Kelsey. He highlighted, or she highlighted him, his name. And guys, that, that's what it's like when we come into the presence of the Lamb. He, he highlights us, and then we give our honor to others and back to Him. And in, in, in the community of the kingdom of God, nothing is ours. And everything is ours. There is no distinction when you're in Christ. You're not, and I know we don't even know how to think about this yet, but there is neither male nor female. Jew or Gentile. Again, the concept of, of how we even think about the self when we go into the presence of God, and you can read about this, and I, I encourage you today, even at Camp Redeemer, go and read Isaiah 60 and Revelation 21. You'll see all these nations bringing their best stuff into the city of God because they're just like, take it. It's yours. And the moment that happens, the world comes alive. That's what things are meant for, to be given away. Not to prop yourself up so that you're consumed with this. That's what's happening with Haman. He's trying to keep things, and, and as he's keeping them, it's just evaporating in his own hands. Part of how you know that the gospel is changing you, part of how you know if the kingdom of God is being set up in the camp of your heart is if you are able to celebrate the accomplishments of other people. as opposed to getting jealous that you don't have that. Or you didn't get that promotion. Or you didn't, you didn't get that raise. But are you able to, to really be thrilled when other people are honored? Haman could not delight in the honor of others because he was too intoxicated with himself. Uh, you know, when... This is, a, this is a, a dirty little example, but... You know when somebody takes a picture with you in it, and you grab the phone, what are you looking for? It's your own face, right? And the only reason I say that is because I want us to, to really own the fact that there's a little Haman in all of us. And that there in, the, in the kingdom of God, there actually is a way to live, to be as noted, noticeable of others as you are yourself. To have... The, your attention, y'all, this is why our grandmothers have all of our pictures on their dressers, because they've learned that the delight in the other person is actually so joyful. It's so joyful. And when we live to only prop up the self, or when we only think about the self, um, when we're blinded by the self, Y'all, it really does, and we, got, we have to think about this today. It ruins our communities. Our communities become so hollow. We look, we look down and in as opposed to up and out. We become very self-conscious as opposed to self-forgetful. And all those friends and the crowds we accrue to support the self, all the likes, you know, will turn on us in a second because there's no substance to our relationships. You see this? In verse 13 of chapter 6, Zeresh, his wife, and the wise men said to, to Haman, you know, if Mordecai is a Jew, you're going to fall before him, which is a very, very, if you go back and read the chapter, the last verse in chapter 5 is the very opposite tune that they were singing prior to this chapter. And that's because in the kingdom of self, other people become inconsequential. They're not, they're not important to you unless they build you up. Now, I want you to think about what makes... If you think about uh, what makes relationships in your own life substantive, who are the people? Who are the people that like actually mean something to you? I know it's simplistic to say, but what makes a what makes a relationship substantive 
is the gospel. When someone loves you, when someone loves you, despite what they get out of it. When someone, when someone sacrifices you for you, and, and when you're in relationship with them, um, they don't make you feel like a, a burden, and, and they're open to what you need from them. That's what the gospel and the kingdom of God does. It lays down its life for its friends. And even further, in God's kingdom, when someone shares something that makes them vulnerable and needy in your presence, you guys have experienced this too, I'm sure, when someone actually gets needy in front of you, you can feel closer to that person. You can feel drawn to them even deeper. But the the kingdom of self, the self outside of God, seeks to hide from you because I'm not so sure what you will require of me, and so I become self-protective. I found myself uh, walking around, I love to walk around Lincoln, and I found myself in uh, the 13th and E neighborhood, and I got to be honest with you, I was a little scared, Don Marie, I was a little timid, okay? So I'm walking down the street, and I see the bus stop, and I see some people at the bus stop, and uh, my instinct was to go the other way. And the reason why is because I saw a person who only had this portion of his body. He's in a wheelchair. And I decided, I, I said to myself, Matt, like, walk. Walk. To, these are images of God. Walk towards people. And when I walked ba- past this, this guy, I, I looked at him and I said, hey, man, what's up? And he said, hey, man, what's going on? Almost as if he had been very used to being dehumanized and he knew how to humanize others. And I'm not kidding, that night I lost, uh, I was up at night, just like King Xerxes, losing sleep. And I was in this portion of scripture in my daily reading of scripture. And Isaiah 56 verse 3 says this in one translation. Make sure no physically mutilated person is ever made to think, I'm damaged goods, or I don't really belong. And, you know, the the self is afraid of what's different. But the kingdom of God embraces vulnerability for the sake of, of relationships. And Esther shows us the sobriety of giving honor and caring for other human beings with herself. She's the embodiment of the kingdom of God here in this passage. Think about the opportunity that Esther has with the king's offer. It's kind of similar to what he's discussing with Haman in chapter 6, but he says, Esther, what do you want? You can have anything up to half of my kingdom. You know, you saw what Haman did with that question. What does Esther do? She says, my people are about to be annihilated. And she did not use that offer for personal comfort or protection. And in chapter 7, verses 6 through 10, once Esther uses her power, once she uses her position to highlight the value of other people's lives, everything in the entire story is reversed very quickly. In verse 7, it says that the king arose from his wrath and drinking, and he goes out to the garden, but he then, then he comes back, and he sees Haman at the feet of Esther, and he, accuse him, he, he accuses her in the original of trying to molest Esther. And then, and this is the most dramatic shift in the entire story, verse 9, Haman is impaled on the stake that he built for Mordecai. That's what they used to do in Persia. They used to build these, these high, sharp, wooden things, and they would... Uh, you know, like in, in Lord of the Rings, Two Towers with Saruman, you know, like the, the, stake, the stake comes out of his, like, you know, gut. That's what they would do in Persian. They would hang people and, like, make fun of the, the criminal. And this is what happens to Haman. He gets the punishment that he had built for his enemy. And that's when we see, you guys, this, this is why ain't nobody going to get away with anything ever. 
God's justice is perfect, and it is complete. This week, Claire, Claire Shin took the fourth and fifth graders to play putt-putt, and she gave the, the kids this verse to memorize, and it's one of the most important verses in Scripture because it's God's character-revealing name from Exodus 34, and the, ha- the first half of it we like because it's talking about God being merciful and kind and compassionate, but the second half is just as important because it says that God will by no means clear the guilty. He will punish to the third and fourth generation. He won't let, he won't let anything slide. And what I, want to, what I want to tell you guys is that that's what's coming. This is what Martin Luther King said. You know, he's quoting Amos. He says, let justice of the kingdom of God roll down. And that is good, that is good news to those who are suffering. Where every single little thing that has ever happened will get put back to the way that it's supposed to be. Everything. What's, what's important to understand is that, you know, when we think about somebody getting away with evil, uh, when evil overtakes a person, God promises that they're eventually going to fall into their own trap. And that if we seek to enact justice in our hearts by being really, really angry, that actually God can punish a lot worse than we can. And He will. God's wrath isn't some cruel, outdated teaching that religious people use to make other people scared. But God's punishment on evil is very good news. When it's your family that has been annihilated. When it's you that has been torn through. But also, and this, this gets at the heart of each of us in here, God's punishment on all that is outside of him, on all evil, is actually good news to anyone who's willing to repent as well. Because when you see life for what it is, you see like, okay, if I go my own way, if I rule my life, it is insanity. It's insanity. And I trust in the goodness of God. What's happening is when the self turns towards God, you are beginning to say, Lord, I release myself to you. I am no self outside of you. I don't have a concept of existence beyond you. I do not rule my own life. That's why when when Jesus says, if you abide in me, like the branch abides in the vine, you have life. And you guys know this, when you are doing something that you're not supposed to do, when you are going averse to God and you know it, You can feel it in your body and soul. You feel like a shell of yourself. And the reason why is because you are God's image. And you're meant to live in sync with Him. And when you sync up with Him in repentance, it's like, (gasps) I can breathe. And when you don't, you're heading towards what Haman's getting. And that's the challenge. It's not just like non-Christians that need to hear this. It's Christians. It's us. Do we want to rule ourselves or do we want to let God rule us? And when we turn towards God, that the irony is that when we turn towards the Spirit, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Everything in God's kingdom is reversed. And you guys need to think about this. I need to think about this. What we give up, we get And what we keep, we lose. And so what is it that you're trying to keep? Because Jesus wants it. Not to be cruel, again, not to be cruel. But he's, what that thing is that you're clinging to, he's like, I'm better than that. Try me. Let go. Haman didn't get what was coming to him. That's karma. Haman got life the way that he built it. 
It's very different. How do you want to build your life? On yourself. And when the storms come and the waves come, will it stand? You guys know what jujitsu is? God is the ultimate jujitsu fighter because he uses the enemy's greatest strength against itself. And that's, you know, ultimately, Haman is the seed of Satan. He's the seed of the serpent. And this is what Jesus does with Satan, you guys. The devil wants to kill Jesus, and Jesus looks at the devil, and he says, okay, kill me. And in so doing, he takes the sting of death out of this world at the crucifixion. That's, as, that's why you have death instruments. You know, if you tattooed an electric chair in your body, I'd be like, that's weird. Um, this was the electric chair in the first century. And it became the Christian symbol. Why? It's because God's present even when you don't think he is. Even when it looks like he's the opposite of present. That God can bless in the midst of a curse. You know, you don't have to be a biblical scholar to see in the last verse of chapter 7 that the king's wrath subsided after he saw Haman hanging on the gallows. You may want to punish somebody right now because of what they've done to you. You think God wanted that? The king's wrath subsided when he saw Haman. When, when God, the true king, sees his son Jesus hanging on the cross, his wrath has subsided. Anything that isn't in him will get punished. You don't have to punish other people. It's all wrapped up in him. And in Revelation 21, it says, At the Lamb, the Lamb is the light of the nations. That's what shines bright. And everything else will go into the nothingness from, from whence it came. Jesus is where the kingdom of self and the kingdom of God collide into each other. And perfect justice is formed and birthed into this world. And we are called to go to him. Whether we need mercy or we need justice right now, we go to him. He can provide both. So let's pray and uh, give thanks to God and then confess our sins as Jinka leads us in confession. Father, we thank you for the gospel. Uh, it is... It's bizarre, Lord. It is your wisdom on display. Um, and it looks like a joke to some of us. And it looks foolish to others. It looks confusing. But Lord, um, the, the longer we meditate on our lives and on your word and on the things of this world, we see this is exactly, exactly what we all need. As one uh, scholar says, we need, we need a non-totalizing absolute, meaning we need you to love us, but to deal with sin. Lord, and that's what you did in Jesus Christ. In each of our relationships, God, we, th this is the tension. How do we love somebody? How do we love somebody and tell them the truth? How are we truthful with somebody and it just doesn't feel like cruelty to them? It's in Jesus and so, Lord, let us go to him with our own sin and how we interact with the sin of others. Let us confess our sins because you are faithful and just to forgive us. But then, Lord, you call us into our true honor and glory. Our job is not to wallow in the things in which we have been twisted up in, but our, our goal is to be released, Lord, and to bear the image of your beauty in this world. And so show us that. Show us the path to that. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Thanks, Matt. Um, we're about to enter a time of prayer, and not all, not all prayers are good or helpful prayers. Jesus gives us the story of two people praying, and one is like, Lord, thank you, I'm not like that guy over there. 
and the other can't look up to heaven but prays for forgiveness. And so, in response, let us not pray, Lord, thank you, I'm not like Haman. That, that would not be a good prayer. And so we have a prayer that we will pray together um, because there are good prayers, and there are prayers that are not helpful. And so we'll confess together, and um, Matt said there's a little Haman in all of us. And don't freak out about that. Don't deny that. Um, um, let us not be so shocked by our sinfulness because God, he still loves us. Like, um, people that freak out about their sinfulness, or should I say, when we freak out about our sinfulness, it is because we doubt that God can love a sinner. But God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish. He, but I have a Don Marie, do you just want to come up here? <laughs> All right, let's pray. Let's pray. Let's, let's pray the confession of sin. Gracious and almighty God, you are the one who keeps promises. In your providence, we can place all our trust. Yet we confess we often do not trust you. We worry, we argue, we complain. We do things our way, not your way. We profess faith in you. Then we live life like this. Forgive us, O Lord, in your great mercy. Renew our hearts and our minds. Give us the faith to trust you in all things and the encourage to step forward in that faith. We pray through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let's take a few moments and confess individually. Hear now your assurance of forgiveness. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Shinka. Um, this king delights to give himself to you, and uh, the word for delight is... Uh, Shevitz in Hebrew it comes from, you know that wine, Manna Shevitz. Um, and what I want you to, to consider is that, the, you know, when, when Jesus was going to give him, himself over to God's justice, uh, his will, like he didn't, he didn't want to do that. It wasn't like, ah, uh, yeah, I can't wait to, to go do that. It's like it, it hurt him, it pained him. But then he said, not my will, but yours. And God was very delighted in that, that a human being finally obeyed him, um, that a human being was so united to him that he did the exact will of what he wanted all along for earth to reflect heaven. And when you come to this table, just, just know that that world of delight is coming for you, where death doesn't have a say, where sin doesn't have a say where you're not at odds with people, where there's no like social isolation or awkwardness, and it's just whole, it's good, it's restful. And that's what this table speaks to, that all of that is made possible in Jesus Christ, and he's uniting all things back to himself, uh, heaven and earth. 
And so if that's what you want, if you desire that, you need to come to this table. It's for all those who hope in Jesus Christ. If you don't want anything to do with, with Jesus, um, this table is, is something that we ask that anyone who comes take it in faith, faith in Jesus Christ. And so this is a part of the service where we would ask you to observe if, if you're like, I don't believe any of that. But if you do, please come. So our practice here is to come down the front aisle in two rows. Yinka will be on this side. I'll be on this side. In the outer ring, you have grape juice, not Manischewitz. And in the inner rings, the clear cups, you have wine. So if you want to stay away from the wine, get the purple, okay? I'm going to pray and uh, set the elements apart, ask the musicians up, and then you all are welcome to come to the table. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your kindness. We thank you for uh, delighting in your son, Jesus. And through that delight, we get his honor somehow. Um, that we are wrapped up into the joy that you've always had in and among yourself as the triune community that you are. And so, Lord, help us to taste and see that you're good and that we would uh, magnify your name because of Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit. And, Lord, we thank you for the down payment of the Spirit that seals these things into our heart and into our minds that heaven is true, that the kingdom of God has come into this world, and we can trust um, in your word and in your promises. In Christ's name, amen. On the night when Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he said, this is my body, do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper and he said, this cup is the new covenant of my blood. Drink of it for the forgiveness of sins. For whenever you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. I invite you up.
thank you for your amazing grace and that your love is unending. It's eternal. And so, Lord, help us to know that we are a part of the resurrection and that that begins by the work of the Spirit. And so help us to sing uh, your praises, tune our hearts to do so. In Christ's name, amen. supposed to enter the north or the south side at Camp Redeem. There we go. All right. All right. Look forward to receive the benediction. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus. He who calls you is faithful and he will surely do it. Go in grace and peace.